For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to Books Corner on Strat News Global. I am Surya Gangadharan. This evening, our focus is on a book, India's Pakistan Conundrum, by Ambassador Sharad Sabarwal, India's former High Commissioner to Pakistan, 2009 to 2013. Um, Ambassador Sabarwal joins us from uh, New York, uh, New Jersey, rather, in the US. Uh, sir, good to have you. And um, Ambassador Sabarwa, welcome. Um, India's Pakistan conundrum, managing a complex relationship. Who should know about it better than you? So I went through the book, um, starting with the last chapter, uh, The Way Forward. Is there really a way forward for India and Pakistan? I mean, uh, is is it... Um, what's your sense? Well, uh, thank you, Surya. First of all, thank you for the chat on my book. Uh, as you might have seen in the first six chapters of the book, I examined the nature of the Pakistani state. And for various reasons, whether it's religious extremism or civil military equation, dominance of the army or ethnic fault lines, etc., etc., Pakistan is a highly dysfunctional and abnormal state, if I may use that word. And what I argue is that you cannot completely normalize your relationship with an abnormal state. Look, it's mm -hmm. not going to be possible to normalize the relationship uh, until Pakistan changes radically its, both its internal and external orientation, which is adversarial towards India. Uh, so if you set out with that goal, uh, you are going to be disappointed. You know, that's, uh, that's inevitable. But because you cannot normalize the relationship, uh, of course, doesn't mean that you don't manage it well and leave it in a state of free fall, uh, in which it has been for various uh, phases in our history of 75 years. Uh, most recently, post Uri, it went into that kind yeah. of phase. Mm -hmm. Or leave it entirely uh, to the military means. Uh, that's another argument that I advance in my book. Uh, so you asked me for the way forward, and what I have concluded, as you might have seen in the last chapter, is that for the foreseeable future, uh, the best you can do is to manage this relationship, manage it at the lowest possible levels of volatility and violence by combining, first, veterans, uh, secondly, calibrated and discrete punitive approach whenever required, as required, and of course, also giving a role uh, to diplomacy. So that's the broad favor, uh, way forward uh, that I offer. But as we go more into the discussion, some of these issues may come up. Isn't that the situation we are in now, where there's no dialogue, uh, there's no trade, um, there's uh, terrorism is at its perhaps its lowest. <clears throat> so isn't this, in a sense, the ideal balance we, which we've realized? Uh, let's leave trade aside for the moment because, you know, trade also means employment in India. It may not be on a very large scale. Pakistan uh, has not been a very large trade partner for us. But, you know, look at the economy of the border areas, uh, which was benefiting when trade was going on. But that's uh, a whole different subject. Uh, no, there is nothing wrong um, with the current situation when uh, you know, there is no dialogue and yet terrorism is down. The LOC is calm. Uh, except that we don't know how long this situation is going to last. But look, Surya, this situation has come about because of two reasons. Uh, first uh, is Pakistan's precarious economic situation. Now, Pakistan's economy has been in the doldrums most of the time because of structural flaws. And above all, it's adversarial posture towards a much bigger and much better endowed neighbor in India. You cannot sustain that. It imposes very heavy burdens, unbearable burdens on your economy. So it's been breaking down time and again, requiring IMF intervention. Uh, but now what has happened is uh, that it's become uh, 
much more difficult, A, because of the COVID pandemic, which impacted all economies, and B, because of the Ukrainian war, <clears throat> which led to increase in commodity prices, particularly of oil and so on. Fortunately, some of them are coming down now uh, for the good of the world. Uh, but that's put Pakistan in an extremely precarious situation, and this has continued for the last three, four years. Secondly, uh, the, the most important thing is gray listing of Pakistan by the Financial Action Task Force. Uh, look, it came about 2018 primarily because the Americans pushed for it. The Americans pushed for it to enlist Pakistan support in their efforts to pull out their forces from Afghanistan, which is uh, what they eventually did. But it has indirectly benefited us a great deal because Pakistan has had to pull back, at least as a tactical move, its hand uh, from you know terrorism and violence uh, against India, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, now, will this situation last? It will be our hope that it lasts, you know, and uh, then eventually leads to Pakistan taking a more enlightened view of the situation. But as you know, Pakistan also has developed a very close relationship with the Chinese now actually yeah. part of our larger uh, China problem. And uh, you know, these situations are not dynamic. We have seen this, these kind of stable situations in the past. For example, after Mumbai, we were able to stabilize the relationship for some time. In 2012, violence was significantly down, both from the LOC and in Kashmir, and yet it broke down. Uh, so, as I said, these situations are dynamic and uh, things can change again. Now there, uh, I believe, if I may add, sentences here. I think diplomacy has a role. Uh, as someone who spent 38 years in the foreign service, I cannot accept the proposition uh, that uh, diplomats have no role even in a most difficult situation. Mm -hmm. uh, diplomats don't give up until, you know, things go to an armed conflict or a war, and we are nowhere there. Uh, short of that, I think diplomacy has a role in managing this relationship better. Look at the LOC ceasefire. It was restored in February uh, 2021. Yeah. Uh, now, it didn't come about all of a sudden. DGMOs one day talked to each other and said, let's announce it. There is a background to it. Uh, yeah. There was a dialogue uh, between heads of the intelligence agencies, from what we know from the public domain. But there was some kind of diplomacy which led to that. So with that, from the free fall mode in which we were after URI, we have shifted to the management mode again, in a sense. Uh, now, uh, therefore, I believe that uh, diplomacy should continue to play its role as and when it can. Again, again, my caution is don't set your sights at normalizing this relationship. It's mm -hmm. not going to be easy in the foreseeable future, but to manage it better and to manage it at the lowest level, uh, levels of volatility and violence. So the time for normalizing is not now. It hasn't come. That's what you're so, saying. Uh, yeah, no, for uh, normalizing, yes. I mean, uh, look for various reasons. Because Pakistan is a dysfunctional state, because it's an abnormal state, as I said, you cannot normalize your relationship with an abnormal state. There yeah. has to be a radical shift in Pakistan's internal and external orientation, which does not seem to be on the cards. These are yeah. all assessments. This can change, but this doesn't seem to be on the cards. You, so you cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, normalize the relationship. And at the moment, there are also uh, additional difficulties because of Pakistan's uh, current political situation. Because Imran Khan has been on a war path against uh, the government. So the political situation is such that there is very little room for maneuver for anything constructive with India. Mm -hmm. um, but after the elections, there may be chances of moving a little further towards the management mode, which we did with the ceasefire first. For example, by restoring trade, look at benefits, as I said, our own border areas also, at least yeah. the border areas. Uh, or by restoring the relationship back to high commissioner's level. It's always good to have interlocutors at senior levels in the two uh, capitals uh, to again manage the relationship better. Uh, so, right, not right away, but as things move on and after the elections, there may be possibilities. So diplomacy should be present in the equation somewhere. Deterrence will remain, punitive approach will remain uh, until Pakistan behaves normally towards us. But then diplomacy mm -hmm. should not be written off. That's uh, the only point. I think. So how do you define this normal 
a normal state, a normal Pakistani state, what would it be like? Something like us or what? Look, uh, uh, you know, a normal state can be a democracy, it can be a dictatorship or whatever it may be. It's, you know, Pakistani people who will decide. Although I can tell you that there is a very strong, uh, you know, support uh, for genuine democracy in Pakistan. We don't realize it, but it's there. And now political, you know, actors have, are all disillusioned. Nawaz Sharif got his disillusioned uh, with the army uh, long ago. PPP was always disillusioned with them when Bhutto was, you know, hanged. And then now Imran Khan, who was their blue-eyed boy, is disillusioned uh, mm -hmm. uh, with them uh, again. So, you know, all this uh, uh, then uh, plays a role. But normal state would be like any other normal Bangladesh or, you know, where there is a single power center, you know how to deal with it. It's not the army breathing down the neck of the ruler. There is a single ruler, whoever it may be. Um, and a state uh, which, you know, controls extremism, which, you know, deals in a more enlightened manner with its ethnic fault lines. Not mm -hmm. today's uh, dysfunctional and uh, abnormal state. Mm -hmm. I just like to um, quote uh, something you've uh, written in your book. Uh, threatening language tends to drive a significant number in Pakistan who think constructively of relations with India. So what is your reading of this um, constituency that uh, doesn't see India in adversarial terms? Uh, is it large? Is it influential? Who are they? Uh, no, uh, you know, it's a sizable constituency. I mean. Uh, again, you know, we, we don't realize it, but it's a very sizable segment. It has the following uh, people in it. One, uh, leaders of the mainstream political party. Uh, I have in mind mainly PMLN and PPP. Maybe PTI will someday join. At least when I spoke to Imran Khan uh, many times when he was a rising leader in 2011 onwards, uh, he was always uh, for good relations with India. Of course, you know, he went at a tangent after we withdrew the special studies. He actually painting his own country in a corner. But, yeah. excuse me, this is, uh, uh, this is a sizable segment in the political class which stands uh, for good relations with India. Because, and they, these are guys who are capable of winning electoral uh, power electorally without, you know, getting the support of the army and they are not dependent and they see uh, improvement of relationship with India as a way of cutting the salience of the army in the Pakistani polity and the position mm -hmm. that they enjoy. And then uh, sizable segments of business and industry stand to gain from open trade and economic relations with India. At this very moment, there is a strong push in Pakistan to resume trade. But as I said, because of political atmosphere, they cannot do it. It includes segments of the media. It includes a segment of the academic community, at least in elite colleges I interacted with students. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, you know, it includes uh, members of the civil society. Now, it's not as if they have uh, started liking India all of a sudden, but they have seen what Pakistan has gone through in terms of terrorism uh, because of their own policies or the repeated economic breakdowns and so on. And then the information revolution, uh, all this has helped uh, them to realize that a stable relationship with India is essential in their own interest. Now, come to the people at large. Uh, so we are people at large in Pakistan, like people everywhere else are on book focused on bread and butter issue. If you do an active survey and go to someone and say, what do you think of uh, relationship with India? What do you think of India? He's going to voice his national position in Pakistan. Yeah. Yes, Indian would voice the Indian position uh, and would say they've been wrong on Kashmir, India. But it's not as people get up thinking of Kashmir and they think of it through the day. There is very little uh, traction on Kashmir internally, I can tell you. Ask a Pakistani politician to win an election on the plank of Kashmir. He'll not be able to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, the army, of course, has different interests. It has this institutional interest of preserving its uh, status in the Pakistani yeah. politics. So it suits it to use Kashmir and, you know, that's how it builds up uh, and it's hangers on, you know, build up that is the, uh, on Kashmir. Uh, but it was not an issue, a determinant of any significance of people's choice during the 2008 election, free and fair. 
relatively free 2013 election when I was there myself. And even 2018, I don't think it was an issue of any kind. Mm -hmm. so, your effort to, yeah. is about constituency. Mm -hmm. Now, you refer to some silver linings in your book. Yes. Do you see the fact that um, the army today has had to go back to um, uh, Nawaz Sharif and the PMLN, you know, mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. having tried out PTI and find that it isn't working? In a sense, the army's own options are uh, getting more and more limited. Would you see that as a silver lining? Uh, yeah, I, I see that. Uh, you know, um, let me start with that. There are a uh, few silver linings which I have in my book. But this is the most important silver lining. Either that they cannot take over power as they used to in the past. They stage a coup and take over power. Uh, they cannot do that. They use ever more ingenious ways of, you know, controlling the things yes. behind the scenes. They are not going to give up easily because uh, they have many instrumentalities uh, in their hands to coerce people, politicians. Look at what they did to Nawaz Sharif. Uh, mm -hmm. But the options, as you said, are slowly running out. They'll still find politicians. You now Imran Khan is gone. They can find someone else who does their bidding. Yeah. You know, they do everything to bring him to power again. Uh, I am not uh, ruling that out, but things are not that easy uh, for them as they used to be in the past. For some other reasons, uh, which I will, uh, which I will come to. Now, the other thing is uh, silver lining is that vocal constituency, which I mentioned earlier, which realizes in its own interest that a stable relationship with India is necessary. That the policies of the past have not laid off the information revolution. We don't realize its importance. When I was Deputy High Commissioner, people were dependent in Pakistan entirely on Pakistan radio and Pakistan TV for information concerning India. We were constantly demonized. Today, people can find out about the other country a lot from the internet and the social media. To give you an example, I made a speech on the Indus Waters Treaty in Karachi in April 2010 uh, to set out the Indian position. And it is largely blacked out some signal from somewhere to black it out. We put it on the internet, we put it on the High Commission website, I sent it to political leaders, etc. And slowly it found its way into the uh, debate on the Pakistan's water problems within Pakistan. So that's uh, another uh, change. Then increasing questioning of the army, which I mentioned. Look at the way they are being questioned now by Imran Khan, mm -hmm. once they are yeah. oh, yeah. Uh, then the two uh, major political parties, this is a point which you made earlier, uh, which used to call, collaborate very actively with the army, uh, you know, against each other. Uh, now they have to cooperate with the army at times after Shabazz came to power, you know, yeah. this PM with the army support because they are disillusioned with Imran Khan. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, they realize that giving too much of space to the army eventually harms them. You know, it doesn't work. Uh, in fact, during the period 2008-13, I saw PPP, although they were at loggerheads, you know, but they collaborated in putting through some very important constitutional amendments, including to give more autonomy uh, to the provinces. Uh, that's the 18th Amendment. You might have heard of it. Yeah. Last, uh, Surya, I uh, felt it very clearly. There is realization of the growing gap between the uh, when I was Deputy High Commissioner, people would, you know, ridicule, say, ah, oh, this largest democracy, what kind of democracy is it? Or, uh, uh, you know, economically, we were not doing uh, as well, you know. Which is true. The world. Now, uh, you know, I heard people at times in events where I spoke, uh, once or twice introduced me as a representative at that time of the world's uh, fastest growing economy and world's largest democracy is only hardline India baiters who would criticize, you know, that India hasn't achieved any economy, you know, mm -hmm. makes a difference is 10 times larger than Pakistan's economy. The gap is growing. Uh, all these are silver linings, but they are not strong enough uh, in front of the institutional interest of the army. Yeah. As I said, they are holding strong and they are not going to give up. Nobody gives up, uh, you know, his position of privilege and power uh, easily. So uh, normalization of situation in Pakistan by its very nature will be A, a slow process. And B, it will be driven internally. 
because anyone mm. tries to drive it from outside, even uh, the Americans, mm. uh, completely gets discredited. The army says, oh, look, these guys are interfering in Pakistan's internal affairs and interfering with our government. Mm. It'll be a slow process when it happens, anyone's guess. So I say in the foreseeable future, uh, things don't uh, look like normalizing completely in Pakistan or Pakistan becoming a normal state. Ambassador, one of our viewers has posted a question. Um, can you please tell us a little bit about the Baloch movement? Are they as oppressed as they claim to be? What about Chinese exploitation of their resources? Uh, this is from very, very briefly, yes, uh, we are completely oppressed in Baluchistan. Baluchistan as a province is completely oppressed. There is a chapter in my book, if you read it, on ethnic fault lines, uh, which uh, describes all this. Uh, you know, how Punjab has done the best economically. I do not have those figures in front of me right now, but Baluchistan yeah. has dismal social indicators. Uh, its economy is only about 3% uh, of Pakistan's economy. Very large area uh, physically, but uh, low area, yeah. economically insignificant, uh, social indicators wise, uh, wise uh, left far behind. Uh, and of course, the Chinese policies have been very exploitative. You know, there is this copper uh, gold mine, uh, which the Chinese have been operating. The, they were given a further contract, I think, for about 10 years or so. And my Pakistani interlocutors would tell me in their candid moments that that was being a completely exploiting situation. Uh, it has been said that nobody knows the, the proportion of gold and copper which is taken out. It's never been tested by any international laboratory. Uh, a large part of the gains going to the Pakistanis or to the federal government, very little going uh, to Baluchistan. And that situation has not changed. And then there have been five insurgencies. Uh, the first four driven largely by uh, tribal uh, sardars. The fifth yeah. one again started with Bukti's killing really, you know, uh, it, it picked up. But now it's seeped into the middle classes. Educated youth uh, have been participants in that uh, insurgency. And what is the response of the Pakistani state? Completely, you know, arm twisting and uh, strong handed, uh, head, uh, handed methods. You know, when they, whenever they have set out to, you know, uh, to retrace the economic situation, the Baluch grievances, etc., it's been left midway. There are attempts that have been made. Uh, so it's a situation of complete So I just want to come to um, the uh, nuclear issue, which I've also uh, mentioned in your book. You write that uh, nuclear power has placed a serious limitation on India's ability to coerce the Pakistani military into altering its behavior. Mm -hmm. Would you uh, explain, sir? Well, look, uh, uh, Surya, it's self-evident that if we have to militarily change uh, Pakistan's behavior and posture towards us, persuade them uh, or coerce them into doing so through military means, that requires uh, giving them a crushing blow. Uh, you know, short of that, you take tactical actions, etc., you know, cross-border raids or... We crossed a very, very important threshold when we attacked Balakot, yeah. a, a terror target in Pakistan proper, not in POK. Uh, and we gave a very important signal, but that's again a tactical move. Uh, and all this, you know, has an impact, but not to the extent of, you know, making the Pakistani establishment change its mind. That needs a crushing blow, something on the, on the scale of Bangladesh. And the nuclear dimension has made it difficult for us to do so. That has to be acknowledged. That's an unpleasant reality. Uh, but that has to be acknowledged. The fact is that uh, you and I can think here and you know our strategists will keep on thinking of circumventing uh, the nuclear dimension and giving a blow to Pakistan. They must continue to do so. But it boils down to this, an elected leader in India has to authorize a consequential military strike capable of giving a big blow to Pakistan in the knowledge that by accident or by design, it would go to the nuclear dimension. Yeah. Look at the difficulty of, the, of making uh, that decision. So as I have said in my book, nuclear dimension in this, in this region has 
helped us vis-a-vis -vis China militarily and economically more powerful China. But vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, it has made it difficult uh, for us to solve the problem entirely by military means. So, you know, it has to be combined uh, with uh, various other things. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Would you advocate um, engaging the military directly? Is that something an elected civilian government in India would uh, should do? Uh, look, you know, this, uh, uh, I think I explained it very clearly in my book. Uh, when they say, when many people say, engage with the real power center, which is the army, to solve your problems, they say, look, the Americans have been meeting uh, the GO army staff and others, yeah. the other countries do it. Why? And they do it for practical reasons, because the civilians are helpless. For yeah. us, there are some difficulties. One, of course, you know, there is no equivalence between. We will not accept this situation. I, I saw, you know, even Biden as vice president going to the GHQ to meet uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Even Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State went. Uh, no Indian leader can do that. There is no equivalence there, you know. Uh, that's, of course, a practical problem. But there are people like me when I was serving and others who can talk to them. And we do talk to them. Uh, if you get my book, you'll see a few instances where I did uh, mention what a senior military interlocutor told me. Uh, so here is what I say about this. You talk to all stakeholders in Pakistan, and that includes the army, to manage this relationship well. So after all, what did we do last year to restore the ceasefire? Imran Khan couldn't have done this. Yeah. So we talked to uh, the intelligence leadership, which is ISI, which is, in other words, the army. So somebody from our side uh, talked to the army. And, uh, you know, that's how it all came about. But if you think that by talking to the army, uh, you are going to transform this relationship into a normal relationship or transform the nature of this relationship. That's not going to happen till the army um, changes its worldview. Yeah. Uh, Ajwa has been making very enlightened sounding statements, you know, politics, mm -hmm. economics, etc. Uh, we have seen this tactical shift in the past also. And, yeah. You know, Musharraf did it, Zia did it when his western border heated up. Uh, Kiani did it to some extent, and Bajwa is uh, doing it. But it's a, to my mind, there is no sign as of now that it's anything other than a tactical move. Would it become a strategic choice? We'll have to see as we as we go forward. So do talk to them, uh, do to, to the extent possible to manage the relationship, uh, but do not have uh, the hopes of normalizing this relationship only because you are talking to the real person. Sir, we are completely at the end of our time. Uh, uh, great insight talking to you. Congratulations, sir, on your book. Um, I enjoyed much. reading it. Uh, Pakistan you. is always a source of interest for all of us here. Thank and um, let's hope your uh, sales are uh, go well. Thank you very much, sir, and uh, pleasure talking to you. Thank you, sir, here for the chat. Thank you very much. And for those of you who joined us on this uh, show, um, uh, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and other social media. Thank you and good night.